can start now. Auzu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Inna alhamdulillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruhu wa na'udhu bihi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyiati a'malina. Man yahdihillahu fala mudilla lahu wa man yudlilhu fala hadiya lahu. ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته <coughs> so we'll continue our series on the lives and works of the famous islamic scholars and for the past several weeks we have been studying ibn hazm and his jurisprudence <coughs> is not very well known because most of the people most of the muslims in the world belong to one of the four leading madhahib the maliki hanafi shafi and hanbali and obviously there is a little bit of a spattering of the alul hadith as well but not many people know ibn hazm and the zahiri madhab or his methodology very well partly the reason is that this was outside of the four established madhahib and partly because it prospered in spain which was away from the mainstream of islam the main land of islam which was at that time centered in baghdad under the abbasid caliphates whereas the umayyads had established an islamic uh, islamic rule in spain for centuries <clears throat> <clears throat> so now we'll talk about ibn hazm as we had studied that initially he had studied maliki fiqh then he leaned towards the shafi'i fiqh and then he started to follow the zahiri methodology carving out a name for himself and following a path that he designed for himself i will quote what he said about speaking the truth and i will quote a verse from surah al maida islam and rim wala yakhafuna lawmat al ain dhalika fadlu llahi yu'tihi man yasha wallahu wasi'un alim the such people do not fear the criticism of people who criticize them or who throw mud at them and this is out of fadl of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is allah's blessings that he gives to whoever he likes whoever he wants and allah is very wide he is he is in all, all encompassing and all knowledgeable ibn hazm in one of his treatises mudawwat mudawwat al nufus wa tahzib al nufus wa zud fi razail he mentions that as regards the accusation accusation which my ignorant enemies are launching against me saying that when i consider a thing true i do not hesitate to oppose anyone though it may be the whole of the inhabitants of the earth and that i care little to adjust myself to the usages and customs adopted without a reasonable cause by my countrymen what is trying to say is that my enemies who really do not understand me they have launched an, uh, an attack against me because if i think that something is right and my opponents are wrong then i do not hesitate to oppose anybody even if it be the entire mankind and i will not adjust myself to the customs and cultures which have been adopted without a reason, without a reasonable cause by his countrymen so he was highly evidenced based scholar and for him the evidence was the quran and the hadith and more specifically the text and the apparent meaning of the words of the quran and the hadith so now he responds by saying that i must say that this quality with which they reproach me lomat alain this is reproach that the call this quality with which they reproach me is rather one of my greatest virtues it's the fadl of allah subhanahu wa taala not to be compared with any other of my qualities so he has been given several qualities by allah subhanahu wa taala but this quality of not being afraid of the reproach of people who criticize him when he speaking the truth is his greatest virtue and it is from the blessing of allah subhanahu wa taala <clears throat> and by my life i assert that i did not possess it which god forbid it it would be one of the favors which i would desire most and ask of my creator that if i did not have this quality then i will ask allah subhanahu wa taala to give me this quality to speak the truth even if it meant opposing everyone else so this is the dalika fadlullah yu'ti man yasha wallahu wasi'un alim that's why i put this verse here 
And the same thing I advise to all those whom these words of mine, mine may come. So he's like addressing us as well. He will derive no profit from following others in vain and superfluous things when by it he provokes the anger of Allah or betrays the judgment of his own reason or does harm to his body or soul or imposes upon himself a pain or imposes upon himself a pain completely useless one. So standing up for truth even if the entire mankind opposes you it's, it requires courage and it's the fadlullah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to whoever, whoever he wants. <clears throat> so now we'll talk a little bit of history and geography as well as we have been doing in this series. So there is an island in the Balearic Islands, which are part of the Spain and located in the Mediterranean. It is known as Majorca or Mallorca. And this is where Ibn Hazm had to migrate. So it was his hijra in, in a way. He was welcomed by the governor of Majorca, who was, whose name was Ibn Rashik, who was a learned man and loved intellectual arguments. Ibn Rashik was very impressed when he saw that Ibn Hazm bitterly refuted and overpowered Maliki jurist Abu al-Walid bin al-Bariya in a debate and gave Ibn Hazm the permission to spread what he believed to be the truth. So in this island of Majorca, Ibn Hazm made famous Maliki scholar Abul Walid al-Baji. Al-Baji had spent around 13 years in seeking knowledge from eastern countries and then returned to his land Andrus. When he returned back to Majorca, the Maliki scholars of that region convinced al-Baji to debate Imam Ibn Hazm. So now at this point, Ibn Hazm has developed a reputation for himself. He was famous or infa infamous depending upon which side you are, but he was also known as an Imam now. He was no longer a student. So Ibn Hazm was already recognized as extremely knowledgeable in various sciences and a powerful debater. So the Maliki scholars of that time needed someone who was of the same stature or a higher stature than Ibn Hazm to debate. Now Al-Baji had numerous debates with Ibn Hazm, but the records of those debates are not available. Al-Baji had the strong support of the Prince of Majorca. And thus Ibn Hazm, as usual, was subjected to lots of trials and difficulties, which made him leave the island in 440 AH uh, after Hijra. And this is the year in which the governor, Ibn Rashid, also passed away. So he did not have a patron at that time. Now, historians did not record very exactly settled down afterwards. <clears throat> now, let's look at historically what Malorca means. It's Islamic Malorca. So in 902, Isam al Khulani conquered the Balearic Islands and it became part of the Emirates of Cordoba. So 902 is the current era. The town of Pama was reshaped and expanded and became known as Medina Mallorca. So the Islamic name of Mallorca is actually Medina, which means the city, Medina Mallorca. Later on, with the caliph, when the caliph, with the caliphate of Cordoba at its height, the Muslims improved agriculture with irrigation and developed local industries. So now the Muslims of that land at that time seemed to be ahead of the times, of their own times. They knew how to improve their agriculture with irrigation reforms and technology. And they also established local industries. So these Muslims were well ahead of their time compared with the rest of the Muslim world. However, as has happened in the history, throughout history at many, at many instances, the caliphate was dismembered in 1015, so 100 years after it was established. Mallorca came under rule by the Taifa of Dania, and from 1087 to 1114, it remained an independent Taifa, which is like a province, but it was an autonomous or independent uh, province. During that period, the island was visited by Ibn Hazm. However, an expedition of Pisans and Catalans in 1114 to 1115, led by Ramon the III, Count of Barcelona, overland the island, laying siege to Pama for eight months. After the city fell, the invaders, miraculously you would say, retreated due to problems in their own lands. And then they were replaced by Almoravids from North Africa, who were the opponents of uh, Banu Umayyah. They ruled this island until 1176, so a period of about 60 years. 
And then the Almoravids were replaced by the Almohad dynasty until 1229 for another, so another 53 years. And Abu Yahya was the last Moorish leader of Mallorca. As I mentioned earlier, Muslims were given the name of Moor at that time. And one of the most famous Shakespearean character, Othello, was actually a Moor. He was a Muslim. Now, I will quote Ibn Hazm, the best gift that Allah can give his servant is to endow him with justice and a love for justice, with truth, and a love of truth above all else. I will repeat, the best gift that Allah can give his servant is to endow him with justice and a love for justice, with truth, and a love of truth above all else. And we see that Ibn Hazm lived the life that he talked about. He was not only a man of words, he was a man of actions as well. And what he said, he exemplified by his own actions. May Allah give all of us this ability. Amin Ya Rabbal Alameen. Now, this is a very sad chapter in Islamic history. And it's not the only incident. There is actually an article written by an Orientalist about the burning of books in Islamic history. And unfortunately, it has deep roots where books written by scholars from their sweat and blood were burnt by their opponents. And it has happened several times. So in Sawail, at the order of Al-Muqtadid bin Abbad, who was the second independent Amir of Sawail in Andalus, that the books of Ibn Hazm were actually bur burnt. And the scholars mentioned this may have happened in the year 455 or 456 after the Hijrah, corresponding to 1063 and 1064 of the current era. Al-Mu'tadid bin Abbad reigned from 1042 to 1069, so for 27 years he ruled. So Ibn Hazm's response to the burning of his books, this guy was a genius, not just that he was a scholar of religion, he was a man of truth, he was a man of courage, he had diplomatic ability, he had administrative ability as he was appointed minister several times, and he was an outstanding poet as well. So when this thing happened, it was not just his books that were burned. His heart was burning as well. His mind was on fire as well. His soul was suffering as well. His soul was suffering as well. And he puts it into his words. Translation, even if you burn the paper, you will not burn what the paper contains, for it is in my heart. It will travel with me wherever my horses carry me. It will descend when I do and will be buried in my grave. Stop talking about burning paper and parchment and speak with knowledge instead. It means that if you have disagree with me, counter my argument with knowledge rather than burning my paper and parchment because you are not taking away my knowledge which is inside my chest so that people may know who really understands. It's a challenge that he gave. And I will narrate another incident which most, most, likely, <coughs> which most likely happened to Imam al-Ghazali that he was traveling and uh, the pirates or the robbers, actually the highland, the, the robbers uh, overtook the kafila, the caravan, and they took away everything that the people had, including a bag, which Imam al-Ghazali was carrying. So Imam al-Ghazali said, you know, take any money that you want, but return my bag to me. And they said, what is so precious in your bag? And they say, it's my knowledge. It's the knowledge that I put on paper. And the head of the robbers sarcastically told Imam al-Ghazali that what use is a knowledge that can be taken away from you. If your knowledge is on paper, paper is perishable. Your knowledge will also perish. This was a moment of awakening for Imam al-Ghazali. And from then on, he started to memorize his own knowledge as well. <clears throat> So this is the paper that I was uh, that I quoted earlier. It is written by Maribel Fierro, and it is the control of knowledge in Islamic societies. This paper is available online, and she cites several instances in which books of scholars, Islamic scholars, 
were burned by the Muslims who opposed that scholar. Instead of coming up with their own argument based upon knowledge, they decided to just silence their opponent by burning their books so their people will not be, in a sense, misguided. So Ibn Hazm's verse, she also quotes this verse. Ibn Hazm's verse is quoted above, start with the burning of books and finish by inciting to, in, to engage in debate on which arguments need to be used so that people could assess who is on the right side and who is in the wrong. It's a very reasonable argument that Ibn Hazm made. A decision has to be made either by coercion or conviction. So either by pressure or by convincing on the basis of knowledge. So Ibn Azam seems to be concluding that in reality, what we see functioning is often a mixture of both pressure and conviction. The studies of attempts at controlling knowledge collected here show that they seldom produce lids that hermetically close the pot, while they frequently result in covers they just try to contain the steam of what keeps boiling inside. So this pot of knowledge is inside the brain and inside the heart and inside the soul of the scholar. You cannot simply put a strong lid upon that that will extinguish it. It's just a simple temporary cover which is trying to contain the steam of what keeps boiling inside. And eventually it will boil over the covers, it will burn the covers, and it will spill out and spread. And this is what happened. They tried to burn the books of Ibn Hazm. They couldn't contain the knowledge that he had. They couldn't control him. him. They could not control his knowledge. And the 80,000 pages that he wrote, or he's reported to have wrote, many of them actually still are available, including his uh, masterpiece, al muhalla and many other books. Now, Ibn Hazm was rather harsh in attacking his opponents. And this is a trait or a quality that we see in other scholars as well. And a study of Ibn Hazm's harshness will also help us understand why some scholars were a little bit harsh. So why are some scholars harsh on their opponents? And this is from a book written by Muhammad Abu Zahra. Muhammad Abu Zahra's book we used when we discussed the life and works of the four leading Sunni Imams. He has also written a book on Imam Jafar al-Sadiq that we discussed. He has written books on Ibn Hazm and Imam Ibn Taymiyyah Rahmahullah as well. So from his book, he points out main reasons for the harshness in, in Ibn Hazm in his writings. So he mentioned that first, there cannot be greater punishment that can be inflicted upon a scholar than the burning of his books. Just imagine that. If you have written a book and if the book is burned in front of you, it's your lifetime, it's your work of lifetime your sweat and blood that is being burnt. Even noble men lose their temper and calmness when afflicted with such trials. Conspiracies of the rulers and fanatic scholars against him increase him in his harshness. So that's one reason. Ibn Hazm, after all, was a human being, a great human being, but still a human being. Man has been created weak, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran. The second Another reason was due to a serious illness he suffered, which made him impatient and harsh in his attitude. Now, I've not been able to find, but my study is limited, what kind of ailment or what kind of illness Ibn Hazm had. But these are the two reasons given by Muhammad Abu Zahra. Now, we'll spend some time about Ibn Hazm and Zahri methodology, but this is a topic that we will be studying uh, in subsequent lectures as well, inshallah. So Ibn Hazm believed that Zahiriya was not actually a mother, but rather a methodology. And this is a very important point. Because when we studied the life history of five Imams, Imam Malik, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafa, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and even Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, they themselves didn't even know perhaps that they were establishing a mother or that what that their knowledge will eventually go towards the formation of rigid Madahib, that subsequent scholars would not even want to deviate from those fatawa which were established by earlier scholars. Rather than consider Imam Shafi's approach as a methodology, Imam Abu Hanifa's approach, Imam Malik's approach, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq's, their approach, that they were working on a methodology. They were not establishing rigid fatawa. But unfortunately, the Muslim mind 
seems to have closed at some point in history. So Ibn Hazm believed that Zahiriya was not a madhab, but it was a methodology that could be taken up by subsequent scholars. And depending upon the issues that arise at particular time in a particular place, they can utilize this methodology and apply it to the understanding of Quran and Hadith, the text. And then he said two scholars may arrive at the same or different conclusions without blindly following anyone while using the same methodology. He did not, Imam Ibn Hazm did not believe that Imam Dawood Ibn Ali al Zahiri was the founder of the Zahiri Madhab but a prominent jurist who treated who treated on this path. So again, I want to say something which is my understanding as well, that the Shafi'i Madhab, Maliki, Hanafi, Hanbali were not established as such by the scholar that we consider to be their founders. Similarly, Madhab Jafariya or Faqa Jafariya was not simply the work of Imam Jafar Sadiq only. All of these Madhab had subsequent scholars who understood this thing that there was a methodology that needs to be followed. But after a certain period of time, it was thought that it's now done. No more ijtihad. Our earlier scholars were more pious, more knowledgeable, and their knowledge cannot be challenged. And it's like a consensus that we cannot violate. But Ibn Hazm did not believe in this. Zahiri scholars in various eras have differed when it comes to the issues of usul and furu. So usul would be a principle. For example, innamal amalu bin miyat. It's a usul. Okay? Or that if there is a dire necessity, then even something which is haram can become permitted, but with certain conditions. Now, these principles are, uh, you can say, the uh, according to the maqasid al-sharia and the usul al-fiqh le and legal maxims, they can be used and utilized to solve several problems. But this has to be understood. And as I mentioned that unfortunately, the scholars of a particular mother become very rigid and do not want to deviate at all when it comes to contemporary issues and using the usul and the furrow, the principle and its branching to find out uh, if there is a better answer than the answer given by earlier scholars. Now, Ibn Hazm also believed that priority has to be given to apparent text, the apparent meaning of the text. So in other words, if a word in the Quran or Hadith has a common meaning, then we should not start looking for uncommon meanings. So Ibn Hazm believed that laws should be interpreted based on the apparent text and not based on the figurative or metaphorical meaning unless it is other text, consensus or the context that indicates that figurative meaning is intended here. Now Imam Shafi also has the same position as he mentions in his Al-Risala, the narrations from the Prophet wasallam should be accepted as general as they apparently are. Allah al-Zahir min al-Am unless there is something to indicate that it is otherwise, or there is a consensus of scholars of Islam that the meaning in that particular instance is figurative and not zahir, and that it is khas, restricted, not arm. For example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses for the fasting in Ramadan, that when you wake up for suhoor, you can continue to eat that the white thread becomes separated from the black thread. And we know it's in a very famous hadith that Adi bin Hatim, who had just converted to Islam, would sleep with a white thread and a black thread under his pillow. And when he could distinguish between the two, he will continue to eat until that time. So when he came to the Prophet, the Prophet kind of smile and say, you know, you're pillow must be very big, O Adi. And then he explained to him that it was a figurative way of telling that look at the horizon until you can see that the dawn has is about to start. So again, here we know that the apparent meaning cannot be taken and we do not need to have a white thread and a black thread to determine when to stop eating uh, after suhoor. So here we have a clear-cut evidence from the 
Prophet sallallahu himself that the meaning of those words in that particular ayah is metaphorical. And he also said, it is not permissible for anyone to change the meaning of a Quranic verse from its apparent meaning or to change the meaning of a hadith from its apparent meaning because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنَّهُ لَتَنزِيلُ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ نَزَلَ بِهِ الرُّوحُ الْأَمِينَ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ لَتَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُنْذَرِينَ مِنَ الْمُنْذَرِينَ بِلِسَانٍ عَرَبِيٍ مُبِينَ It is from Surah Ash-Shu'ara and I have highlighted بِلِسَانٍ عَرَبِيٍ مُبِينَ The approximate translation is that this Quran is a tanzil, gradual revelation from the Rabb of the Alameen and it, the Ruhul Al-Amin came down with it, Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, on your heart, O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam, so that you become one of those who are warners. And it has been revealed in the clear-cut manifest Arabic language. So the understanding, my understanding based upon what Ibn Hazm has written is that if a word, a particular word has an apparent meaning, then that is the meaning, that's the intended meaning rather than trying to find out uncommon meanings. And it is from Ashura Ashura, and there is another verse in Al Maida that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala criticized the earlier people. You are al Kalema Ammawadehi. They change the word from its position. And Ibn Hazm's meaning was they give a different meaning of the word than the intended apparent meaning. So now we come to literalism versus textualism. And he also gives an example where the text can have a figurative meaning and we have to find out its apparent, its intended meaning through the context. So he gives an example of this verse, verse from Surah Al-Baqarah, wa ushtabu fi qulubihim ul ijla bi kufrihim. So we'll, we'll look at this verse. The Zahiriya and the understanding of Zahiri scholars like Ibn Hazm is not literalism. So can we have to understand this thing. That is not harfiya, rather it is textualism. So he's not talking about the literal meaning of each and every word in a particular ayah. They look at the text of the entire ayah and then determine the meaning. It means that the meaning that is apparent from the context of the text based upon the rules of the language. And this is clear to those who have studied the books of Ibn Hazm. And there is one example here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 93, about the disbelief of the Jews. The literal meaning, and into their hearts, the kaf, ijl, was made to sink because of their kufr. Now, Ibn Hazm explains that the ayah does not mean the kaf was literally made to sink in their hearts. He said that it was the love of kaf that was soaked in their hearts. So although this is not the literal translation, it's not the harafiya translation, but it's the approach based upon textualism that you look at the text based upon the rules of the language and then you try to explain. So oftentimes people will claim that Zahiris are literalist, but Ibn Hazm himself has explained the difference between the literalism, the harafiya and the textualism. Unlike the methodology of Imam al-Shafi, the rejection of payas and assumed intent behind laws of Islam in permissibility or prohibition of something is the hallmark of Zahiri methodology. Ibn Hazm believed that there is only one lawmaker, there is Allah. So they rejected the payas and they also went with the assumed intent behind the laws of the Islam when it comes to the permissibility or prohibition, halal and haram. So Ibn Hazm believed that there is only one lawmaker, there is Allah. And it is only Allah who can authorize something to be permissible or prohibited through the Quran or Sunnah of his Prophet So now what he's trying to say is that if something has been made halal or haram by the Prophet wasallam, then we have to accept it that it is through the authority of the lawgiver who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through an unrecited wahi inspired to the Prophet ﷺ about a particular issue. And when the Prophet ﷺ said that this is halal or haram, even if we do not find it as a text in the Quran, we have to accept it. Because the Messenger ﷺ is also given an authority by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So his authority is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said that's the role of a faqih or a scholar is 
not to declare things to be permissible or prohibited based upon his assumption of intent behind the laws. So there are scholars who will look at the permissibility or prohibitiveness of something based upon the assumption that what is the intent be, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this is halal or this is haram, what is the intent? Here the Zahiri methodology is different. They say, why do we have to assume the intent? If Allah said this is halal, it is halal. If it is haram, it is haram, period. Similarly, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu So they do not go into the intent. They do not go with the qayas and they don't go with the assumed intent behind the Islamic laws. Now the Zahiris rejected the qayas and both the Zahiris and the people of hadith, alul hadith, believe that since narrations, the narrations from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are in abundance, it is necessary to amend in the qayas and rely purely on the text, which is from the Quran and the Sunnah. Ibn Hazm and the Zahiris in general did not regard themselves as belong to a certain madhab. This is again something that I've already explained. But they considered themselves to be as mujtahids who only had in common their commitment to a certain methodology. Now, in this way, a person who is a Shafi, Maliki, Hanafi, humbly can use the same methodology, use ijtihad, and come up with the answer to a fake issue which may be different from what is in his own madhab. Does it mean that he should be cast out of his mother? Does it mean that his decision, his fatwa is wrong? According to Ibn Hazm and the Zahiris, it's the methodology that counts. And if your methodology is based upon the textualism from the Quran and the Hadith, you can come up with an answer which is different from the answer given in your own mother. And so I think it's an important point when it comes to dealing with contemporary issues. So this is the end of the today's lecture. Inshallah, we'll continue it next week as well aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa la dhikrullahi akbar salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah sallallahu alaihi wa sallam assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh